We're in a series about sea dragons in the Bible, a symbol of chaos and destruction. In our last episode, we talked about how humans can become chaos creatures, like the snake of Genesis 3, agents of chaos and disorder in the world. And today we're going to look at a human who straight up is called a sea dragon by the prophets. That is the Pharaoh of Egypt who enslaved Israel in the scroll of Exodus. The stories about him are designed to compare him to the snake of Genesis 3. The idea that their lives are made bitter with harsh enslavement thematically connects to working the ground in grief and in pain. And also their enslavement, their avad, is happening in the field, which is where the snake came from. It's like the snake dragged him out of the garden into his domain where they're doing the work and the enslavement to the ground. So if Pharaoh is the seed of the snake, who is the promised seed of the woman who will come to confront the snake? God is depicted as raising up Moses as a new deliverer for the people. The word salvation and deliverance is introduced in this story of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, and Moses is the key figure. And if there is an analogy between Pharaoh and the snake, that makes Moses something like a new Adam. The first thing God teaches Moses to do is to turn his staff into a snake. There's something about Moses that the narrator wants us to see him as an image of somebody who, with God's power, can somehow counter the forces of death and chaos. Today, Tim Mackey and I talk about the theme of the chaos dragon in the scroll of Exodus. I'm John Collins, and you're listening to Bible Project Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Here we go. Hey, Tim. Hey, John. Hello. Hello. Hey, we're talking about dragons. We are talking about chaos and dragons and to sea serpents in the Bible. And sea serpents. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you're going to give a little summary of where we've been, mm -hmm. try to package it up. Yep. Yeah. I had some new clarity when I was on a run this weekend. I was like processing our, the conversations we have had, and I think some things became clearer to me. So recall how we started our reflections, which is on the dark chaos waters in the second sentence of the Bible. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the skies and the land. Cool. Great. When? How? Where? Why? And then the story begins. And the land, now the land, you should know, the beginning state, pre-creation state, was wild and waste, and darkness was over the surface of the abysmal, deep chaos waters. Darkness was over the abyss. Yep. And the abyss is the dark that's chaos right. waters. So you start with two images, that of an empty, uninhabited, unordered realm, and that of a dark, chaotic ocean. So that's the beginning of the seven-day narrative. When you turn to the beginning of the second story in the Bible, which begins in Genesis 2 verse 4, it's the Garden of Eden story. And there you also begin with a lifeless, unordered chaos realm, which is the desert. So not the waters, but the desert. But the desert. So one is too much water, one is not enough water. Yeah. So these are complementary images of non-creation. <laughs> <laughs> what we think of as like contradictory. Oh, sure. You know, yeah, on the literal level. On the literal level, an yeah. ocean versus a wilderness. That's right. But on the symbolic level, they are identical. And I'll just link back to our cosmology series we did some years back in the podcast, and these were the two most common ancient Near Eastern ways of describing the pre-creation state, or chaos. So what's important is that this is not, chaos is not God's rival okay. in the Bible. But chaotic powers are the rival of the most important gods in the ancient Near East, in Egypt, you know, whatever god happens to be in charge, the sun god or the sky god, has to battle the darkness and the night, like every day. <laughs> it's like, whoa, I hope, the, hope sunrise happens again in Babylon and Canaanite mythology and so on. However, the unique conviction of the biblical authors is that God is. Like God's being is primary reality, which is life and order and goodness. And so um, the chaos is not God's rival. But it is the rival of creation, hmm. meaning creation is something that doesn't have to exist. Right. And this is the logical conclusion because everything around us is constantly disintegrating and going back into 
disorder and nothingness. So, it's conditional. It's conditional. Yeah, its existence is conditioned upon something more powerful than it. Mm -hmm. And that it, in the claim of the biblical authors, is God, mm. who just is. Okay. So the chaos is uh, the rival of creation. And so this is why at the end of the Bible, you have to do away with the ocean, and, there's <laughs> no, and you yeah. have to do away with darkness. Okay. And why the garden city is a garden and not a wilderness. Hmm. So, chaos is the opposite of creation. Then, what you get introduced in these opening stories in the seven-day narrative and in the Eden narrative are inhabitants of the chaos realm, hmm. but that are creatures. So, you have the stars in the dark, in the nighttime, and then in the waters, the two things that represent chaos, darkness and waters, there are creatures there that God puts, the stars and then the sea dragons on day five. And you're told that they're good. Hmm. They're not bad. Right. They're good. Then in the beginning of the Garden of Eden story, you're told about a snake that's a, one of the beasts of the field that God made. Yeah. It's good. Uh -huh. So, whatever these creatures are, they begin in the biblical story as good. Hmm. And that's important because for the biblical authors, if it exists, it's God's creation, which means that it's good. Hmm. Now, creation can, of course, set itself on the trajectory back into chaos and death and disorder, but that's not because the stars or the sea dragon or the snake are, in their essence, evil or bad. And so, I think what we're seeing in the Garden of Eden story is a depiction of the fall of two types of creatures or the failure of two types of creatures to become what they truly are. You have both the failure of this land creature that crawls, right, the snake, mm -hmm. and it uses its God-given craftiness or shrewdness towards its own deceptive ends. Then there's some backstory as right. to, well, why is that creature doing that? And that's... That's filled out later and... Yep. There are hints given in the Eden narrative, mm -hmm. but uh, it's filled out later in the biblical story. Primarily, the focus is on the human folly and mm -hmm. failure. So, what happens then is that both humans and the snake become agents of chaos and disorder. In other words, they can make choices that are opposed to the will of God, which is to bring about gardens and life and community. And so, the snake and the humans become agents whose choices drag creation back into chaos and disorder. Hmm. So, when we're talking about the sea dragon, the biblical authors have a unique view of the sea dragon that stands out in their ancient Near Eastern context. Because in all the other dragon slaying mythologies of Israel's neighbors, the sea dragon is the rival of the storm god and is essentially evil and chaos. Yeah. And that's not how the biblical authors depict the sea dragon or the stars or the snake, <laughs> which all become merged. I see. So somehow that just became an important distinction in my mind. The rivalry distinction? Who is what's rival? <laughs> and then also that the nature of the sea dragon is that of a creature who, like humans, has embraced its own ruin and has become an agent of chaos mm. through its choices. Yeah. But not it's not of its nature evil any more than humans have an evil nature. Mm. So, we're coming into this theme focused on the idea of a dragon, mm -hmm. but then quickly that gets us connected to all sorts of other creatures that are also depicted as chaos creatures. Yes, yeah. Snakes and scorpions and even lions. And even lions, yeah. But then it also gets us into a much broader category of just what does it mean to be a creature in rebellion against God? And then we've got not just the dragons, but we've got the Elohim, the stars. Yeah, that's right. Who are also, yeah, yeah. can be in rebellion. But then those two ideas get merged in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. Where when we're introduced to the snake... It's this creature, I mean, we don't learn this in that story, but yeah. we've talked about this. There are hints and little mysteries in that story. Yeah, but it's a creature who we learn is an Elohim who decides, I don't, I don't like my place. Yeah, at and least Ezekiel certainly saw it that way. Ezekiel saw it that way. As he reflects back on Lots it. of other yeah. Second Temple literature yeah. is even more explicit. Yeah. 
And so those two ideas get merged between these kind of what we would call fantasy creatures, and let's not get into that, but, yeah. you know, dragons and yeah, yeah. what is sea serpents and stuff. And then these angelic beings. Mm -hmm. But then it also merges into the idea, and we talked about this with Cain, mm -hmm. is that yes. you can become... Yeah, humans. Humans can be embodied. Agents. And become of, the dragon. Of Exactly. So the dragon or the snake becomes an agent of chaos. So we're talking about of agents humans. of chaos. It's like the broadest way yeah. to talk about this theme. Yeah, that's right. But the way you become an agent of chaos is by turning away from God's goodness and wisdom and word. And to be an agent of chaos is making yourself a rival to God, but not in the sense that like you could actually really put up an actual fight against God. Yeah. But in the biblical imagination in that you are fighting against creation. Yeah, that's right. And God is pro-creation. Like, he wants creation to win. Yeah. And so in that way, you're a rival against God. Yeah, that's right. By being against what God wants to have exist in the world. Yeah, And then right. deep embedded into that is this mystery of why does God allow mm. for anything to fight against creation? That's right. Yeah. And I guess we're not really getting into that, the problem of evil, I suppose. No, no. I think more we're just trying to understand the nature of of these characters associated with what we call evil. Yeah. But I think it's really important to recognize that these creatures, stars and sea dragons and the snake, the way they are first introduced is as good, part of God's good creation. However. However. They are placed in the realm ah, which was separated from what was good. That's true. Yeah, the darkness, the and, darkness and the sea waters. Yeah. And the sea. That's right. Those weren't called good. Those were separated, mm -hmm. and it was the light that was called good. Yep, and that's it was right. the land that was called good. Yeah, you got it. So the creatures are put in a realm that's like, hmm, yeah, not yeah. explicitly called bad, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but is separated so yeah. that something could be good. Yeah. yeah. What, why? What, what is that about? No, I'm, I'm, I think it's a hint towards the role, showing an awareness of the role these creatures are going to play hmm. as the story unfolds. But it's important also that it's a balanced view. They are in the realms of chaos and disorder, and we know that they're going to represent chaos and disorder as the story unfolds. But the biblical author wants to make a very important philosophical, theological statement about the nature of God and the nature of creation. If it exists, it is in its essence good. And if it has become an agent of chaos, that's because of through choices that it's made to decline away from its essential God given nature, which is to be good. If it exists, it's good. That's one of the clear conclusions of Genesis <laughs> chapter 1. That doesn't mean we'll stay good, mm. but it is designed for good, which is why in Isaiah the prophet's vision of the new creation, like in Isaiah chapter 11, the, even the snakes are redeemed because babies play with them. Oh, yeah. They're harmless now. They're harmless. And the lions are there. Yeah. You know, and wolves. Right. And, 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 so, he's, and he says there's no more darkness. Exactly. So, maybe that will... The significance of that <laughs> will become more important for somebody other than myself as we keep talking. But somehow, I felt important for me to say that to myself at this point in the conversation. And those creatures, specifically the angels, they can be good, and they are often good. Yes. And yes. they align with God. Correct. And we don't get stories of, like, sea serpents that align yeah, with God. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think there, it's just, it's an image. Well, you get three places. There's also two psalms where the sea dragon is called upon to praise God oh. or is described as God's rubber ducky is, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. to play in the ocean. Yeah. So that's one way of minimizing right. or dethroning. Or showing uh, the sea serpent in its good yeah. condition. That's right. And that, that is one of the dragon taming strategies of the biblical authors is to say, in its essence, it's a part of God's good creation. But in another dragon taming strategy that the biblical authors often use is just to talk about God smashing its head. Hmm. And that's leaning into the cultural mythology that was widespread. And as we're going to see in the story we're going to focus on today, it's a human set on analogy to the dragon and also to Cain. So what we also focus on in the story of Cain is important after the introduction of the snake is that humans can become agents of the dragon who has become an agent of chaos. <laughs> yeah. Making humans agents of chaos. Yes. So, we're going to turn our attention now to the story of Pharaoh in the Exodus story and find out how the biblical narrator is giving us many, many cues 
that Pharaoh has become a new Cain, that is a new agent of the snake and therefore an agent of chaos. Okay, we have looked at Exodus chapter 1 that many times in different podcast series that we've done. So I just want to set the scene and draw attention to a couple details in this well-known story. So the Exodus scroll begins with a summary of the 70 descendants of Jacob who went down to Egypt at the end of Genesis. So there was a famine, food shortage. Joseph was down there giving out food, and they went down there to dwell. So that's how the story begins. Then we're told that all the generation that was alive at the end of Genesis dies in the first sentences of Exodus. But despite that tragic death, we're told in Exodus 1 verse 7, the sons of Israel were fruitful and they swarmed and they multiplied and became very, very strong and the land was filled with them. Hmm. That's the language of... Genesis 1. Yeah, the blessing. Yeah. The blessing. So, what happens is that a new king arises over Egypt, and this is in the future because this king didn't even know who Joseph was. And so, this king looks at this thriving, multiplying immigrant population in his land that's gaining a lot of cultural influence. Whatever becomes strong represents Mm. some degree of favor, abundance, Mm. power. Yeah. And it freaks him out. So he says, look, the people of Israel have become more multiplied and stronger than us. Come, let us act skillfully with them, or else they will multiply, and when war happens, they'll add themselves to our enemies and make war with us and go up out of our land. Kind of a worst-case scenario. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, What's the verb? Catastrophizing? Catastrophizing, (laughs) yes. Yeah. We talked about that, huh? I mean, I suppose if you're just trying, this is not popular to try and think empathetically with ancient tyrants, but if you try, you can imagine the train of thought right. that could lead somebody to this conclusion. Yeah. But it's certainly not the only way he could view this situation. Yeah, he could view them as allies. Mm-hmm. So what's interesting here, in our Firstborn podcast series, we explored this very story and how it set on analogy to the story of Cain and Abel, Cain looking upon the divine favor mm, and blessing yeah. upon an, another, and that that poses, you know, faces them with a choice. Mm-hmm. But that also, the Cain and Abel story made us look back at the story of the snake and mm. Adam and Eve and ask, oh, what was going on with the snake? That the snake felt like he needed to trick the humans and mm. dethrone them. Yeah, And this is how... The Hebrew Bible is meditation literature works. So that little verb, let us act skillfully with them. Yeah, what word is that? It's the verb chakam, which is the root of the Hebrew noun chokmah, okay. which is in Proverbs. Let's be wise. It's wisdom, yeah. So it's not the word arum that's used in Genesis 3 of the snake. That we translate crafty. Crafty or shrewd. Yeah. So it's not a verbatim hyperlink, but it's a thematic connection. Hmm. Yeah, it's a wisdom word. It's a wisdom word, yep. Yep. And as we're going to see, this is a classic Hebrew Bible style. As you go on from the story, the narrator is going to give you more and more clues that this is a snaky move okay. and a snaky word in this mm. guy. Because wisdom is a good thing. Right. Just like craftiness or shrewdness for the snake is a, not a negative word, inherently. Right. Mm-hmm. You can be good or bad with your shrewdness. Mm-hmm. You can be good or bad with your wisdom. Mm. So he makes a bad choice. He chooses to enslave and oppress them. He makes them start mass-producing brick and mortar and enslaves them in the field and with brutality to build storage cities for Pharaoh. Hmm. The field where Cain slayed Abel, where the snakes live. Exactly. Okay. So this is just a little quick study in how Hebrew vocabulary and hyperlinking works. In the Garden of Eden, you are introduced, the snake was more crafty than any animal of the field. Hmm. The snake pulls his move. And what we're told is that because the humans listen to the snake, that the ground is cursed on account of you, human, this is Genesis 3.17, in grief 
You will eat from it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles the ground will sprout for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. And Yahweh Elohim sent the human out to work the ground from which he was taken. So all this, you're going to go outside the garden, back to that desolate wilderness, mm -hmm. work that's called the field, mm -hmm. and your life will turn to death and be full of grief. Yeah. And then you die as you just enslave, are enslaved to the ground. Yeah, and and then the image that you probably get as an ancient person is imagining then being a laborer yes. in someone's field. Yes, that's right. Just what a brutal life. Yeah. Day after day, just tilling mm -hmm. and working hard. Yeah, no rest. Yeah, your body's just being broken down yep. until you die. Yep. So these exact words are being activated in Exodus 1 mm. when Pharaoh enslaved the sons of Israel, it is the same word as the word in the Eden story, to work the ground. Oh, okay. Avad. Hmm. The idea that their lives are made bitter with harsh enslavement thematically connects to working the ground in grief and in pain. Mm -hmm. And also their enslavement, their avad, is happening in the field, hmm. which is where the snake came from. Yeah. It's like the snake dragged him out of the garden into his domain. His domain where they're doing the work and the enslavement to the ground. So all of that network of words is being activated in Exodus 1. And also the building of cities with brick and mortar has only happened one other time in the biblical story, <laughs> and that's in the building of the city of Babylon. Hmm. So this story takes the first kind of failure and folly story of Genesis 1 through 11 in the garden story, and then takes the last failure and folly story of Genesis 11 which are bookends around that first movement of Genesis, and it weaves the language together mm. in this story. Yeah, and it's the city that is built out in the mm. wilderness. Yeah, that's right. And Yeah, that the humans make. Right. So this, come, let us be wise, let them build cities with brick and mortar, this is the language of the city of Nimrod, the king of Babylon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Pharaoh is being set on analogy to the snake, also to Cain, hmm. who brings about death in the field, yeah. and also to Nimrod. Who are both agents of the snake. Yeah, Cain that's and, right. And, yep. Well, I guess Nimrod's Cain not explicitly Nimrod. said that. I was thinking Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, I see. Yeah. But Nimrod's kind of like a proto-Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, he is. Oh, he totally is. Yeah. yeah. So that's the setup here. Okay. So with a few quick brushstrokes, the narrator of Exodus wants us to see that Pharaoh is a bigger, badder, Snake Cain Nimrod. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he's unleashing death on a scale that we haven't known hmm. in the biblical story so far, <laughs> at least by, at the hands of humans. Okay. We haven't seen any enslavement in the story of the Bible so far, is what you're uh, saying? Well, I mean, there are slaves mentioned in the book of Exodus, but in, in terms or of- in Genesis even. Yeah, of like, you know, Hagar's enslaving a, a people group, making them- prisoners for forced labor unto death. Yeah, that's this is a new picture. Okay. It's a new low yeah. in the human human story. Okay, so from there, fast forward God raises up a deliverer through the waters who floats along in an ark, a little boy. That boy grows up in the house of Pharaoh, but eventually murders an Egyptian, and he has to flee into exile, just like Cain. And God spares his life, and God appears to Moses 40 years later in the famous burning bush story. And he says, go back to your people and to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So... Moses has five objections to this, and he and God have a long argument about whether or not he's going to do it. And the third central objection, it's the center of the five, begins this way. Moses says this is in Exodus chapter 4, what if the people don't consider me trustworthy or listen to my voice and say, Yahweh hasn't appeared to you? And then Yahweh said to him, well, what's that in your hand, Moses? And he said, mm, uh, it's a staff. 
Yeah, I'm a shepherd. <laughs> kind of tool of trade. And God said, yeah, why don't you throw that on the ground? And so he threw it to the ground, and it became a nachash. Mm, a snake. A snake, yeah. And Moses ran away from the snake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is what your body automatically does yes. when it sees a snake. Yes. Freeze or yes. just get right. out. That's right. We've talked about this <laughs> earlier in the series, our yeah. different snake encounters that we've had. Although you didn't run, you learned how to <laughs> yeah. tame that fear. Back. So Yahweh said to Moses, send out your hand, grab it by its tail. Mm. Yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> Its head is still loose. It'll just yeah. whip around and yeah. grab you. But he sent out his hand and he grabbed it and it turned back into a staff in his palm. Ooh. Wow. Dude, this guy has power over the snake. Hmm. Wow. And a lot of faith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is funny because he said, what if the people don't trust me? Mm. And actually, and here he does trust God. Yes, yes. it's interesting. I'm just imagining like reaching out and grabbing a snake by the tail. Yeah. Especially if you know it's dangerous. It's oh just a really bad idea. <laughs> it's a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. God asks Moses to put his life in danger. Yeah. And then it turns in back into a staff. Mm -hmm. And so now he realizes like, oh, the snake, mm -hmm. this thing I was, my whole body was telling me to fear. Yeah. I have power over. That's right. Yeah. Because of obviously like God did something. Yeah. Because <laughs> of God's power. Now, in this story, what's interesting is that God is depicted as raising up Moses as a new deliverer for the people. The word salvation and deliverance is introduced in the biblical story, in this story of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, and Moses is the key, key figure. And if there is an analogy between Pharaoh and the snake, then what does that make Moses? Hmm that it makes Moses something like a new Adam, at least potentially, because yeah. he just grabbed a that snake. seed of the woman. Yeah, a seed of the woman. Who yep. can crush the snake. Yep. So there's something about Moses that the narrator wants us to see him as an image of somebody who, with God's power, can have power over the snake, can somehow counter the forces of death and chaos hmm. in the story. So here's what's super interesting is that when Moses finally goes to Pharaoh in chapter 7, he's with his brother now, and this is the scene where they meet Pharaoh for the first time. And so Exodus 7 verse 8, Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, do a sign, do a wonder for us, then say to Aaron, take that staff and throw it down before Pharaoh. And you, the reader, are like, oh, yeah. I know it's coming. I know it's coming. The Nachash. Yeah, the snake's going to come out. Yeah, the Nachash. Freak Pharaoh out with a snake. <laughs> totally. And what the story goes on to say is, take your staff and throw it before Pharaoh so that it can become a tanin. The tanin. The tanin. The sea dragon. Which is the name of the sea monsters from day five of Genesis 1. So we've taken the vocabulary hmm. of both the water monster and the desert mm. creature. The staff can, can become both. And we've merged those two. Mm. So we're back to this question of what are we supposed to have in our mind? I know. Like the visual picture. I know. I, I picture <laughs> him throwing the staff and then morphing into this massive <laughs> creature that like, you know, is flopping around and all wet and just like, oh, why am I here? It's Pharaoh's <laughs> palace. Arr! And you're yeah. like, whoa, get that monster out of here. So maybe this way, remember our first episode, we saw that the word nachash for snake and the word tanin for sea monster, there's this overlap between them. Hmm. They're both reptilian. And the nachash is mostly associated with the desert, the tanin mostly with the waters. But there are some occasions where you can talk about a nachash in the sea that will eat you. Yeah. And this would be a case where you can talk about a tanin on dry land. I see. <laughs> okay. So it's still likely a snake in the narrative, but being called a tanin yeah. is connecting it like this is... The monster. This is the chaos. The chaos monster. The creature yeah, come right. to life. Yes. So in other words, it's less that you're supposed to picture a sea dragon like poofing into being from the staff. And it's more that it's a snake but with all of the cosmic significance of a tanin. So it's called a tanin. In other words, it's the ideas that swap 
between the, the Nachash and the Tanin. Yeah. And then the story... It gives another twist. Okay. Then, so Aaron does this in front of Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a Tanin. Uh-huh. Then Pharaoh called his wise ones and his sorcerers, and remember the word Nachash. Oh, yeah. Is means the word someone who from. summons the powers of the dead and channels them to magic arts. When it's turned into a, like a title? Yes. So here the pharaoh called his wise ones and sorcerers. Which is like the Nakash people. The Nakash. Yeah, the snake called his snakelings. The snakelings. And they did the same thing, the magicians of Egypt, by their secret arts. Each one threw his staff and it became Tanin. Hmm. But the staff of Aaron swallowed up their staffs. Swallowed. Why? Why oh, are you focusing well, on the word? That's a key word in the dragon slang oh. stories of Israel's neighbors. The dragon swallowing up his enemies mm. is, a, is a common motif. Okay. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar swallows up Israel. Yeah. Like a tanin. Yeah, that's right. The yep. w- Jonahs get swallowed get up. Swallowed by the, up by the sea beast. Yeah. So here, oh, what's interesting is also you have Moses versus Pharaoh, but each one of them has a representative. Mm-hmm. Moses has Aaron. Okay. That he's given orders to. Sure. And Pharaoh... Has his sorcerers. Has... His snakelings. His snakelings. And each one can produce a chaos monster. But Moses and Aaron's is a chaos monster in the service of God's good plan. Hmm. So somehow it can swallow up the bad chaos monster. It's such an interesting reflection. Yeah. Because it's like a good tanin versus a bad tanin. And you're yeah. like, are there any good tanin? Like how to... <laughs> When? Somehow we skipped the story in Sunday school. Like, I don't remember talking about the sea monsters eating each other in Pharaoh's palace. <laughs> it's such yeah. a wild image. It totally is. Yeah. So how do we know that we're supposed to be viewing Pharaoh as a snake? It's cool. There's some interesting words in Exodus 1. You have this, this story. There's something going on here. The first encounter with Pharaoh you think is an encounter with the Nachash. And then when they end up in his court, it's an encounter with Tanin. Mm-hmm. In other words, it was just a conversation earlier, and, and Moses was by himself. But now that we're in the face of the sea monster in human form of Pharaoh, then it's as if the staff like knows how to scale up to become a beast matching Pharaoh's own beastliness. I'm just kind of meditating here sure. on why the shift from snake, Nachash, in the burning bush story in Exodus 4, now to why in this scene is it a tanin. Mm-hmm. But it seems like you're making a leap here that Pharaoh is supposed to be thought of as a Tanin. Yeah. We've talked about him being snaky, mm-hmm. but are you going too far in thinking the Pharaoh is like the sea monster like himself? The sea monster. Okay. So that, that's a good question. The story should at least raise that as an idea in our mind. Because for some reason, the narrator has chosen to switch words. Hmm to talk about what the staff becomes. So it can't be insignificant. So this is often the case when you come across little puzzles in biblical poetry or narrative, and you just got to hold it. It's there on purpose. Yeah. Meaning, if I just hold open that little puzzle or question that I have and keep looking for clues as I read on, there may be some little light bulb moment that's been planted that will give me kind of back reflection. And isn't it interesting that... Uh, As you read on through the story of the 10 acts of decreation that God brings about, the 10 plagues, it ends with the night of Passover and the death of the firstborn, which does compel Pharaoh to let the people go. But then once he lets them go out into the wilderness, he follows them out there, kind of like the snake. He follows Mm. them out there. And Hmm. there's the big showdown in Exodus 14 of Pharaoh charging down towards the Israelites who are just helpless, camped by the shore. Yeah. Really interesting scene. Yeah, the Israelites are stuck now at the edge of the sea, Mm -hmm. and the Pharaoh's army's coming. Yep. So Yahweh says to Moses and the Israelites, stand here and just do nothing until I tell you to walk into the waters. (laughs) So he directs Moses to take that staff, the Mm. same exact staff, and to smack the waters with it. Hmm. Strike, hold it out over the waters, strike them. Smack the waters with the sea monster. Yeah. So, yeah. So, once again, we're like, something's going on here. Hmm. The one with power over the snake and the sea monster, that is Moses, is called to use the power of that staff to 
divide the waters, split、mm, them up, tame the sea. Yeah, and then the waters split, so that dry land emerges, and the people walk through it. Which is a clear Genesis one yes, image、yep. of splitting the splitting、waters. the waters, dry land appearing. Yep. But he's using the power. It's like God saying there is the power of chaos that lives in the chaotic waters that's now trapping you. Yeah, yeah. Death is coming,、mm-hmm. but like you have the ability through me, yeah, to use what should be what which can be an agent of chaos to become an agent of order. Yeah. So in Yahweh's hands, symbolized by Moses's hands holding the staff, even the agent of chaos and death can become a pathway to life.、Hmm. That's the image here. Because the chaos waters are the epitome of anti-creation, non-creation. Yeah. But Yahweh can even bend those towards His purpose for the preservation of life. Well, this kind of gets back to what you were saying, which is like the chaos creature, the sea dragon, is not God's rival. Yeah. Right. Right. It can represent、mm-hmm. what a creature can become, a powerful creature can become when it is anti-creation. Yeah. Yeah. But in and of itself, it's not bad. It's actually part of God's good creation, and so here is a meditation on using it for good. Yeah, God you, using it for good, using the staff that is the sea monster against the chaos waters themselves. Yeah, which are not good. Chaos waters are not good because、mm. they represent not existing anymore. <laughs> yeah, if you walk into them, <laughs> but the sea monster God can use against the chaos waters. I、mm. guess right because the staff is a sea monster. Yeah, it's so much so. Interesting. It is so interesting. God can use an agent of death to defeat the powers of death. Would you say it that way, or would you say God, because the sea monster doesn't have to be an agent of death? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Like true, it didn't have to. It can be the rubber ducky. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could be the like tame、mm-hmm. thing playing in God's good creation. It could actually praise Yahweh, like you said. The psalmist says, and so while we have this category of the sea dragon is chaos, there is a biblical category of the sea dragon being、um, good or being used for yeah, good, yeah, potentially good. And、yeah. in the same way that we think about it as angels, this goes back to how we started. Yes, that's right. Yeah, the Elohim, the host of heaven, the stars in the sky,、mm-hmm. you know. Are often thought of as bad. I mean, these are the like the gods of the nations,、mm-hmm. right?、Mm-hmm. Baal and、yeah. these other like yeah, Marduk and、mm-hmm. yeah, Dagon and all those. But they could also be like God's divine counsel. Totally,、yes. that God uses. Yeah, they could sing for joy when God does His creative work. And yeah, so this goes back to your beginning reflections. Yeah, which is these are not rivals of God.、Mm-hmm. They can be actually allies of God,、mm-hmm. but. When God creates, when He sets into motion life outside of Himself, in some sense, in the way that He gives autonomy to creatures,、mm. He allows for creatures to become、mm. not rivals of Him, but rivals of creation itself. Rivals of their own existence. Rivals of their yeah, own existence. Yeah, I guess if a creature's existence is conditional and dependent, it can destroy itself、mm-hmm. and. I guess if it's an intelligent creature, with a will、mm-hmm. and a mind that's somehow an image and a mirror of God's own mind, then、yeah. it can, of its own choices, choose to destroy itself and others like itself. Yeah, and that's very much the way the biblical story is trying to paint. And so here's Pharaoh looking at a whole group of people going, "They're a threat.、Yes. I need to kill them、yeah. or enslave them," and that is letting. Anti-creation、mm-hmm. embody him and become like the snaky person. Yep. yep. And here is a meditation saying that seems powerful, but it's not more powerful than God. In fact, grab the staff. Yep. Throw down the staff. It becomes、yep. the serpent. Grab the staff. You can control it. It can be used in service of God. Like the thing that we're afraid of, the thing that could like turn us into monsters,、mm. like doesn't have to. You、yeah. can tame the beast. Yeah. That's、yeah, good. It's good.
Yeah, that's right. So Moses holding the staff, he's an image of God. Yeah. Literally and metaphorically. <laughs> holding the snakes. Could you imagine monster. Adam just grabbing the snake, <laughs> just holding them, just be like, ah, yeah, get out of here. Yeah. And then using the power of the sea dragon to overcome the destructive power. That's the crazy twist. Yeah. Using the power. You would imagine like... Adam grabbing the snake, get out of here, snake. Well, and I guess it's not the power of the sea dragon. It's God, the one yeah. who's splitting okay. the sea. I see. But yes. he's using this, what, the, the narrative, the instrument of the sea dragon. Stuff. What does that mean? <laughs> What's, yeah. It's a good Do I question. need a whole long walk with a cup of tea for that one? But certainly. <laughs> certainly. How, let's see where these images go. Okay. Okay. So, and maybe that'll provide clarification. So, in the next chapter, after the deliverance of the Israelites and the waters crash in on Pharaoh and his armies, the Israelites sing a song about it. Yeah. Actually, Moses and the Israelites sing, and then Miriam and a bunch of female prophets and singers sing. And when it gets to the part where they're retelling the story of what happened at the waters, the story is retold this way. This is in Exodus 15, verse 4. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army, he, that is Yahweh, cast into the sea. His choice officers, they sank in the sea of reeds, the deep abyss. Mm, the deep abyss. It's the, the same word as Chaos in Genesis waters. 1 verse 2. Oh, wow. The deep abyss covered them. They went down into the depths, sinking like a stone. So you think if we're going too far with all the connections of these images <laughs> of like yeah. the sea being the chaos waters. Yeah. No, nope, It's right it here. It's right here. Yeah. Verse 6. Your right hand, Yahweh, is majestic in power. Your right hand, Yahweh, shatters the enemy. In your great excellence, you tear down those who rise up against you. You send out your hot anger, and it devours them like chaff. Hmm. So Yahweh's hand. In the narrative, God said to Moses, stretch out your hand. Mm. We've meditated on this over the years now. That somehow the hand of Moses is an image of God's hand. Yeah, the image of God. Yep, yeah. So here's what's so fascinating. When this story was retold, and remember this story was retold every year at Passover. At Passover. Yeah. So this memory is one of the most important memories in the history of the people of Israel. Being rescued out of enslavement to the mm-hmm. snake mm-hmm. through the chaos waters into yeah. freedom. Yep, that's right. And somehow the sea dragon became at that last critical moment the instrument yeah. of opening up the way to salvation and rescue. Such a mystery. <laughs> what okay. does it mean? <laughs> so, dude, check this out. So, this story was retold, and it's referenced many, many, many times throughout the Hebrew Bible. I'll just reference, if you want to take a deeper mm-hmm. dive. Dark, chaos waters. Yeah, into this, I'll recommend two books that have the same exact title. And they were released in the same year, which is apparently why they didn't get into copyright battles. Two books called Echoes of Exodus. <laughs> <laughs> One is by Alistair Roberts and Andrew Wilson. And the other is by Brian Estelle. Both books called Echoes of Exodus. And what they do is they show how, through the rest of the Old and New Testaments, the Exodus story is retold. Hmm. I just want to highlight one of those retellings. Okay. In Isaiah 51, this is the prophet speaking mostly to Israelites sitting in exile in Babylon, hoping to emerge out of it. And then here, the prophet talks to God, hoping for deliverance from exile. And here's how the poem goes. Wake up, wake up, O arm of Yahweh. Clothe yourself with strength. (laughs) Clothe the arm? Okay. So, apparently Yahweh's arm is asleep. (laughs) (laughs) The word word means like... (laughs) Get yourself up from laying down and sleeping. Yeah. Wake up. Interesting. And this is an image in the Psalms, often in lament Psalms. Mm. Like, why, why, oh, how long, O oh Lord? Yeah. How long will you be silent? How long? Mm-hmm. In Psalm 78, God's described as being asleep while we suffer. Mm. Wake up. But notice it's not just Yahweh, it's the arm of Yahweh. Right. Yeah. What is this called? The mat- Autonomy, um, Ooh, part for whole. Yeah. Yeah. I forget which one. One yeah. of those. Those are the two options. <laughs> Synecdoche or metonymy. Put on strength like a garment. Hmm. Wake up as in the days gone by in the generations of old. Oh, like in some past event. Hmm. What past event can I think of where Yahweh acted with strength with his arm? 
wasn't it you who cut Rahav into pieces and who pierced through the Tanin? Rahav is a, a name for the sea dragon in the Hebrew Bible. It's the word to rage, hmm. the raging one. The rager. The rager. Wasn't it you who dried up the sea, the waters of the deep abyss? Wasn't it you who made a road in the depths of the sea so, okay. so that the redeemed ones might cross over? Okay, so he's clearly talking about yeah. the story of yeah. going the exodus through the waters. Yep. Those the Lord has rescued will return. Now he's to go in the future. Hmm. They will enter Zion, that is Jerusalem, with singing. Like a new exodus. The new, so the return from exile will be like the exodus. Hmm. And as we retell the story, we don't even mention Pharaoh. We just mention the raging sea dragon. So, yeah, it was Pharaoh who was shattered in the dark yeah. abyss. Yeah. And here, yep. the prophet Isaiah looks at that and he doesn't see Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. He sees the sea dragon. Yeah. Or he sees the larger cosmic force that is behind and acting through Pharaoh, which is the dragon. But now, remember, that even the dragon is with a twist. <laughs> What's the twist? The twist is when the dragon was introduced, the Tanin, which is called by the same name here, it was good right. in Genesis 1. I see. So the dragon has gone through its own failure and folly. Right. And that story is still emerging as you read through the prophets. But both the dragon and the humans enslaved to the dragon become sad vehicles of anti creation. And that's how Pharaoh's depicted here. So if we had any doubts, that Pharaoh is being depicted as an agent of the snake, and the snake is an agent of chaos. In the Exodus story proper, Isaiah kind of just helps us clarify that that is, in fact, what was going on in the story. Hmm. But there's many mysteries we haven't solved yet, and I think we'll just have to pin that mystery of how the snake, as an agent of chaos, can be used to accomplish God's life-saving purposes. That's a mystery at work in the symbol of Moses yeah. rescuing the people with the snake staff. Yeah. All right. Well, let's sit on that. Yep. So there you go. Okay. Where we're going to go next is we're going to watch this same idea play itself out in a different way in the book of Judges. Because the snake dragon appears in the book of Judges, but in more of a Cain or Pharaoh-like form, in the form of the human agents. And uh, we'll see how that works. Helps us look at the whole story from another angle. But for now, it's good to meditate on what it means for humans to become agents of the dragon. All right. Hi, everybody. This is Dan Gummel, and uh, I'm back with another employee introduction. And I'm pretty sure that you're the newest employee. You're, <laughs> what was this, like week two for you? Uh, I think week three. Week so three? I'm, I'm a newbie for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is John Rooney. I'm new to the studio team at Bible Project, and I work in animation. And in particular, I work on scrollable content for social media. Yeah, tell us a little bit about exactly what that means. So I, I kind of work on short form content that's usually a minute or less. Sometimes it's uh, podcast related. I'm just gonna stop you here, man, because I am such a fan of your work. So many people are such big fans of your work. Basically, what we're doing is we're doing a series called Overheard. Yeah. Right? And so Overheard is what? It's basically taking fun samples from the podcast and then in a uh, format kind of animating what John and Tim are talking about yeah. above their heads. Yeah. And so it's uh, these are going out on YouTube Shorts and also on TikTok and I think Instagram, maybe. Yeah. And uh, there are 60-second clips. I was talking to Alan uh, a few months ago, and he was like, yo, man, he said, uh, there's this guy who's working on it, Jonathan. And he's like, at every stage, it keeps getting better. And he showed it to me. It was such a fun, like, reimagination and kind of development, yeah. I think, both animation-wise and, and our kind of content. A really cool way to, I think, introduce people to the podcast. Yeah. What do you think is the most interesting part about working on that process for you? Um, I think... What I really enjoy is just kind of the imagination side of it and just kind of really upping the humor on that. They're more cartoony than a lot of yeah. other content. So yeah, they're, they're really fun to animate 
and to kind of create little gags for. Tell me a little about your life outside of work. Uh, yeah, so I live in Columbus, Ohio, but grew up in the Northwest in Spokane, Washington. And when I'm not working, I try to stay off screens and go hiking or fishing or. Uh, is there anything that you would want to say to, to the folks listening? Go check out Overheard. Um, say hello to my wife out in Columbus, Ohio, as I'm gone for a week and she's holding down the fort. Cool. Well, here, I'd love it if you, uh, you could read the credits. Today's show came from our podcast team, including producer Cooper Peltz and associate producer Lindsay Ponder. Our lead editor is Dan Gummel. Additional editors are Tyler Bailey and Frank Garza. Tyler Bailey also mixed this episode, and Hannah Wu did our annotations for the Bible Project app. Bible Project is a crowdfunded nonprofit. Everything we make is free because of your generous support. Thank you so much for being a part of this with us.